Now, our next speaker is an avid defender of fact-based information. In 2014, he coined the term factfulness and later co-wrote the Factfulness book, which was launched in 2018. Ula Rosling is president and co-founder of Gapminder Foundation, which he founded together with his wife Anna and his father Hans. Now, Gapminder believes in making education about the SDDs S sustainable development goals, less ideological and more fact-based. Thank you for joining us, Ula Rosling. Thank you very much. So uh, that was a great introduction. Yes, the anti-ideological uh, profile is really what I want to emphasize here. And I uh, can show that um, the, the knowledge that we're conveying and the facts we're working with are pretty neutral. Uh, I do that by testing people's knowledge. And I sent out a um, test to many of the participants. And uh, today now here, I'm gonna show the results of how people answered. Those were nine ABC questions. And this was the first one. We're gonna look at your results and compare it with the data. Uh, let's start with this one. 30 years ago, 56% of the world's population lived in so-called low-income countries. What is to share today? Is it A, B, or C, 9%, 35%, or 60%? Let's look at this uh, starting in a very, very long perspective. Let's go back to year 1800 and look at two indicators, because I also asked a question about life expectancy. This is uh, the World Health Chart, one of our free teaching materials that is used across the world in classrooms to show a fact-based worldview. It's like a world map. You can see all the countries back in 1800, uh, far before development really took off. Uh, it, back then, most countries had a life expectancy below 40 and very low incomes. Norway is uh, quite high there. You're gonna, it, it's the small bubble at the very top, actually. And um, no, the, yeah, uh, you, you will see it soon bumping up. No, it's on top of Germany there in 1800. But uh, the important thing with this world map is that it changes. Let's play the first 100 years in just 10 seconds. Sorry, like this. Um, there we go. So during 1800 until 1900, the world changed. You can see Norway and Sweden and Iceland leading the world there to the right and Denmark being having longer lives than anyone else. That was the Spanish flu. And here we are now in a world in 1960. After the World War, the world looked like this. And this is one of the fact questions I asked you about life expectancy. Back then, 55% of humanity lived in countries where life expectancy was below 50. What is the share today? That was one of the questions. And let's play forward now and see how the world continued changing uh, during the next uh, 30 years or so until uh, uh, year 1990, okay? You can see already by 1990, slightly before the HIV pandemic, uh, most countries had reached above 50 in life expectancy already back then. And here's the second question I asked, how many countries today are in low income? Uh, definition by the World Bank it was. I did mention that in the question, but I'll get back to that. In 1990, that's not so long time ago, right? 58% uh, of humanity, the vast majority lived in a country classified as low income. How many are there today in such countries? Okay, we play forward and you can see how majority of the countries who used to be low income have now reached a middle income level. And if the world continues with this GDP per capita uh, growth roughly after the pandemic, we're gonna have a world where almost no country are on the uh, level where the low income was defined. Uh, and this change, which I just show you, where there are no countries left below life expectancy 50 and there are hardly any countries left, 9% of humanity, in so-called low-income countries, 
compared to what people answered. Okay, so here are the results when I ask this question. Correct answer now we know is 9%, of course. And actually, together with Ipsos two years ago, we asked this in 32 countries. And here are the results. On average, 7.2% of people picked the right answer in Saudi Arabia more than elsewhere. But of course, the uncertainty of these kind of polls are not perfect. Consistently though, across all the countries we tested, people, when they hear low-income countries, they assume it's a lot of people. Very few pick this option. On an ABC question like this, it's actually quite easy to pick the right answer compared to the results. If you ask a monkey, an ABC question, they have a 33% chance of picking the right answer. Monkeys would score better than humans in all the countries where we have tested. Okay, so, so wait, this means that humans are not just randomly guessing, right? They are not just picking A, B or C like the monkeys, do. because if you do that, you're gonna score 33%. To score less than random, requires misconceptions. And these are the kind of systematic misconceptions that, that we measure. When we say low-income countries, people think of something like developing countries, which is completely not defined. And then they assume a majority of mankind live in these kind of countries. In their minds, people don't have multiple categories. They think about poor countries and rich countries. When someone say poor countries, do they mean Poland, Brazil, Tunisia, Philippines or Malawi. In Malawi, there are still lots of kids who don't go to school, where in Poland, every child go to school. It's an enormous difference of what we mean when we say poor and poverty. And that's why I asked about low-income countries. Let's just look at the results. Here are your results. 360 people of you answered. Of course, the most knowledgeable and busy, they didn't have time to answer. So, But those who who answered scored unfortunately worse than Saudi Arabia and the Emirates. 14% managed to pick the right answer. Congratulations, you're pretty knowledgeable. Uh, actually, you shouldn't compare yourself with monkeys. I know you don't like that. You actually like to rather compare yourself with Swedes, like me, I'm from Sweden. 7% of the Swedes picked the right answer. So in this sense, Norway, at least this audience here today, is twice as knowledgeable about the low-income miracle that has happened because these people moved to middle-income countries. And 14% uh, of you picked that right answer. Here are the number of people who picked the wrong answer in all the countries in your audience. Look at your results. 59% of you imagine that the number of people in so-called low-income countries increased you know that the population in the world increased. And when someone say low income, you think that's all the other countries, pretty much the non-Western countries or something, and you know population increased that. And you completely miss that 75% of humanity live in middle income countries, ranging to uh, uh, down in Bangladesh, for example, all the way up to uh, Brazil. And then a country like Chile is actually a high income country but most people don't get that. We fail to realize when the world is changing and when the world goes through what Norway, it took 100 years for Norway to go through that change and the world does it in 40 years, we completely miss it. We don't realize why industries are, are now escaping Europe and, and uh, flourishing in the rest of the world. So that was one question. I asked you nine questions, okay? This was the one at the very bottom. And I'm, I'm gonna focus, of course, on, on those where you scored bad. There were four of them where you scored better than chimpanzees. So I'm gonna skip them completely, even though, of course, it's not really a good thing that almost half of you believe uh, that many countries have short lives and, and you think extreme poverty in rich countries is quite high, etc. cetera. Uh, but let's forget about that and instead focus on the things you don't know, because that's what our foundation do. We don't, we don't really work with education. We try to get rid of misconceptions. So where you score worse than random, there is a job for us to do, right? Uh, the many yearbooks that come out and the climate reports, most of us, we hear about them. Maybe we print them out and put them under our, our arm like this and pretend that we read the book but most of us don't really consume facts. Even though we live in the first time uh, ever when there are lots of facts about pretty much everything, 
so this is the, the, the question. How are we going to make sure that we actually know the facts about the present when we try to forecast the future? Because those people in the middle-income countries moving up the income scale, they are going to consume more, more than any country or any population has ever done before. The real world market is coming next. What we've seen so far is only the trailer, okay? So, but what did you answer wrongly? Well, you had the low income misconception that it increased. Uh, and then also there is another question there where I asked, where are people most, where are people uh, least satisfied with their lives on average? And a majority of you, just like the public when we ask, they think that in high income countries, people are least satisfied. This is a complete misconception. And I know people don't like to think that more money makes you more happy. And of course, there's not such automatic correlation. But if you look at the data, when you ask in every, pretty much every happiness study that has uh, covered all the way from low income to high income, you see a very, very strong pattern. Uh, I want to show this over time because it's such a highly sensitive topic. In our culture in Sweden and Norway, we don't want money to make you happy. We want to re refuse any statement that claim that money makes you happy. But when we do that, we fail to realize why six or seven billion people on earth are struggling to get as rich as we are. Look at Norway to the very far right. You're not the happiest in the world. That's Denmark. But you see this strong correlation. At the same time, there is a huge difference on the same income scale, as you can see. This was in 2006, and since then, the UN has been collecting with Gallup quite good data. It's not perfect at all. Look at the pattern. When countries get richer, I'm going to play this forward up till a few years ago, uh, and you can see now that as the countries get richer, actually many of them fall down. So there is not a clear automatic correlation. Look now, when they move forward, many of them are moving up and down, and India is definitely moving down as, on average, it is getting richer. Many people in India are not experienced a richer life. They didn't share this income with everybody in the population. So, of course, they, I'm not claiming that there is a simple correlation between money and happiness. But there's a good reason for people trying to get richer. Within these countries, the people with higher incomes are often happier. And in general, people strive to get more money, which means there will be more overconsumption, whether you like it or not. And that brings us over to the next topic about climate change. Let me show you this now instead of aggregated country averages. Here is a way to look at the data of number of people on different income levels, dollars per day. Uh, I play it from 1800 just to get the big picture. Back then, most countries in the world were low-income countries if the definition had existed. Norway, Sweden were low-income countries all the time up in, uh, to the uh, First World War, Second World War, a majority was low-income countries. Then middle-income countries, orange and green here, start to evolve. And not until the 70s, there were a portion of countries, this is when I was born, 75, there were two humps in the world. There were the rich and the poor, right? And instead of country average, we must see that within every country there is a huge difference. You can see in 2006 that the hump, almost the two humps have disappeared roughly, right? You can see the big hump in the middle now moving out of extreme poverty. And in 2022, we don't have a divided world. We don't have the poor and the rich. The 7 billion people are there in the middle. In extreme poverty, people are still lacking uh, antibiotics and vaccines because they live in the poor tail in middle-income countries or in the low-income countries in the lower majority of the population, here to the left, you see. But while we're looking at the left, you can see this part of the screen here where, where people have a, an, a, a very low income. Uh, that is the concern of bringing people out of extreme poverty, where fertility rates are huge, populations are still increasing. That's one side of the world. There they need economic growth. Up on the other end of the world, level four, we call it here, high income countries, we can see, I'm going to play this forward with a rough forecast I made with IMF GDP per capita growth to try to predict how many people are going to come up to this level of high income where we are, which means more CO2 emissions during the next couple of years. Just play it quickly forward. And you can see that uh, now in, in, uh, during the next couple of, of years, if I change, I'll try to change the color here to regions instead. You can see that 
in this part of the world, oh, my computer is locked. Let's skip that. And you can do that on the website. Uh, basically, uh, the amount, amount of high-end, high-income consumers is going to increase in all these middle-income countries. And that's really what puts a pressure on the climate and, and the common resources that we share on the planet. And our ability, if we can integrate Europe into that big hump of middle-income countries so that we can collaborate and participate in that global uh, development of, of the rich who are getting richer, right? I'm, I'm afraid that Europeans in general fail to realize the enormous increase of incomes and capacities and education of that big hump of five billions. We continue living in the past where we were ahead of the pack, as you saw in the first graph, but we are no longer. And very soon, we don't have a chance to mandate exactly the rules for everything. We need to start educating our kids about a more humble kind of European. Yeah, you've met Swedes, you know, there is a superiority that used to be before, but now Norway is richer than us. But most people in Sweden still kind of think of Norway as the little brother. We need to redefine our perception of each other when the reality changes. And that is a challenge on the global level. So now I want to end with two questions about climate change, climate action. Uh, this first one is crucial. During the past 40 years, the amount of oil and natural gas in known research, what happened? Did it double? Did it stay the same or did it drop to half? Most people believe, as you can see in this uh, survey, we did a small survey in the UK and in Sweden, and almost everyone, of course intuitively, say, as we have consumed more oil and gas, uh, there must be less of it left in the ground, right? It sounds intuitive, but our exploration of new research have increased more than the consumption. And this is the data from uh, British Petroleum official data. Fossil fuel reserves at the top, we have oil 2.5 times the amount we had in 1980. Known reserves, of course, a different quality of oil, etc. But the gas as well, 2.8 times what we knew in 1980. When people don't know this, they don't realize the challenge of climate action. The fact that they believe the reserves are declining, so they are probably waiting for an automatic price increase. When we run out of a resource, the price goes up and we will naturally switch to something else. That will not happen. The challenge really is, and I tested climate activists on this one, and pretty much everyone are wrong about it. The challenge is we need to stop using the fossil fuels before we run out of it. That's a completely different challenge, okay? Here is the last question. And this one, I'd, I'd say pretty much everyone is wrong about. What happens to the CO2 level in the atmosphere if we have the annual emissions today, okay? There is, there is CO2 up there and we have our annual emissions. What happens? It increases up there or it stays roughly the same or it decreases? Most people intuitively say, if we have the emissions, it must decrease. It's wrong. If we have the emissions, it keep increasing. How can that be? It's pretty simple and it's very crucial. I say this is the most severe misunderstanding about climate action I know about. Uh, please help spread this. Our material is free. I want to explain this to everybody. Every school kid should learn this in school instead of sitting and crying and just being aware. They need to understand how the climate works. Here is an example. If this is the emissions we have, humanity as total, in 2021 and next year we emit the same amount and then next year the same amount again, right? Okay, everybody understands it keeps accumulating. Now I'm going to half our emission. In 2025, imagine we managed to half it. It keeps adding. You see, year by year, the cloud I'm sending up there is half as big as the previous year and than it is now. But it just keeps adding, you see, at a slightly slower rate, but it adds up. There. It's like a bathtub. If you keep pouring in water, it will increase even though you pour in a little bit less. It's not until we reach zero that it stops increasing in the atmosphere. And most of you answered this question wrongly. How could you not know this? Haven't you talked about the climate pretty much every week during the last uh, five years? In Södermalm, in Stockholm, where I live, everybody talk about the climate, but they don't sit down and learn stuff. So what we're doing now, we're creating a free teaching material about climate facts. And when 95% of people are wrong about something, 
It means both the right politics and the left politics are equally wrong. So it's neutral. And these are the kind of facts we're finding, like the low income question. It's where everyone are systematically wrong in the same direction. It means we can have a third position and common ground and realize we're wrong about stuff. And this has implications because the moment we reach zero net emission, look now what happens during the next hundred years, how much of that emission, uh, CO2 in the atmosphere will remain 100 years later? That was the last question I asked you. We move forward. This is a rough model only, right? The amount of carbon dioxide that naturally disappears from the atmosphere is extremely low. You can hardly see it, okay? 100 years from now, roughly 95% of whatever we put up there is still gonna be up there 100 years from now. We'll leave it not just for the next generation and their grandchildren, but it's gonna stay for a very, very long time because the tree, even if the trees capture carbon, as we learn in the photosynthesis, it's a very slow process. And then the trees actually let the carbon back again when, when they uh, fall into the earth, et cetera. It's a very small loop and not much is captured. It's really when it turns into fossil, that's when the carbon disappears. The 5% that will disappear over 100 years goes into the oceans, most of it. These facts we need to understand. Otherwise, climate action becomes an ideological, emotional debate. We need real infrastructure changes to have a real energy transformation. And that needs to happen at the right end of the income scale, while the people at the poorest end, those in extreme poverty, are able to have economic growth with whatever means it takes. I'm ready to say, yes, they have to burn fossil fuels to get out of extreme poverty, because extreme poverty is hell. OK, and the reason we want to stop climate change is to avoid human suffering in the future, 100 years from now. But there is human suffering already going on. We need to keep two thoughts in our head at the same time. We need to help people escape extreme poverty by building whatever infrastructure and resources they need to escape. Right. That is one thing that's at the low income end. At the high income end, we need to change our lifestyle because we are the people who emit the emissions. We shouldn't confuse our emission with the, with the people in extreme poverty. And this, is, I think, is a major challenge when it comes to, to the aid community in the future. To keep your head apart and say, OK, what applies to Swedish lifestyles must not apply everywhere else. You need to look at the data and compare the proportions. And this I don't see in how we're debating the global climate and the kind of pressure we try to push on everyone else, even though the high income uh, consumers are the emitters and the people who really exploit uh, natural resources. Uh, so I'm trying to compile all these facts and make it possible for organizations, governmental agencies. And now I hope really by participating here today, I would like to see Norway to be the first fact-based country in the world. Because I've been trying to push Sweden for a long time, SIDA and UDA, uh, et cetera, to be the first ones. Some people there are really positive, but really to sit down and learn a lot of facts. It takes a lot of time, you know, when you got the driving license, you had to learn all the theory and all the rules for the traffic. And no one does it for free. I think organizations today in a changing world need to require learning from their employees to make sure that we can rely on collective wisdom when we try to forecast the future. Today, we're very far from that. And that's what we're trying to show with Gapminder. The misconceptions out there in the public also exist in this eminent audience who is watching this presentation here today. So please be humble and curious about the world. You pretty wrong about a lot of things. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ola, for your myth-busting. It was very energetic, informative, and fun.